Thank you guys for all your patience. I was so excited to tell you this, to, to share it with you last year, and then, as you all know, uh, my guy uh, herniated a disc and I couldn't make it right at the last minute. So we're here today, and I cannot tell you how excited I am. We have waited as kinesiologists forever for Eastern and Western medicine to start talking to one another and communicating, right? So now, how many people are familiar with the study of nutrigenomics? See what I mean? This is so cool, isn't it, right? Okay, it's taking the natural things like we've done forever, but now using it with science. Now they can watch the gene expressions as you take in certain nutrients. And we can literally, like um, at the booth, you'll see like a study on Alzheimer's with the gene expression showing which ones are going down that shouldn't be. And what happens when you use a Nrf2 activator and how they upregulate, or if they were turned up and should be down, they do. It's so exciting. So how I got started with this, I absolutely am the nosiest person you've ever met. I've always say to my students, we're CSI of the body. Where the crime scene investigator, what happened? Why did that go out of balance? How many times have we heard that? Well, why did I go out of balance? Well, how long will my balance last? What do we say, right? Don't know. As long as, you know, until your body can hold this balance for itself. But then they introduce a new stressor and something else happens, right? But what if, what if there were one major cause that we could do something about. Do you think that would make a difference? I love what Victor Hugo says. There's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. A Nrf2 activation, the time has come. You know, when you know, you don't know what you don't know, this is what was going on with me. How many people in here understand free radicals? Me, I, you know, I had like a oh, little knowledge of a free radical. How many of us understand what oxidative stress is? Okay, I had this much knowledge of it. Didn't understand its importance. Nobody really ever talked to me about it. So I started looking into this and it was Doc that said to me, oh, it's, a, it's the leading cause of nearly every disease. It's at the very core of aging. And he said, as physicians, if you told us, you know, is that important, should I reduce it, we'd say yeah, but back then, the best we had were aspirins and steroids. Really not a good choice, right? So up until now, as Dr. Dew would say, we only had very little things we could do about it. Oxidative stress looks like this. We have this beautiful apple that Larry stole, okay? And then he kept it in his pocket so nobody would know. And it got a little older, right? And it got some oxidative stress. And then he forgot he had it and changed his clothes. And Arlene found it. Uh-oh, right? <laughs> Same thing. It's just a replica of what's going on with the cell inside of our body, right? So. I wanted to know, because I'm a science person, you know, it's not that I don't love you, it's not that I don't believe you, but I believe science. Because everybody's got a snake potion, right? They've always got something to sell us. So I went to PubMed, now this is just a few months ago. There were 1,700, 175,000 studies done on oxidative stress. Now. PubMed is the National Library of All Medical Research. If you really want the facts, go here for peer-reviewed studies, right? When I looked at that this morning, there are 900 more studies being done on oxidative stress. That's in the last couple of months. But it's up from last year, nearly 157. So in one year, 18,112 more studies were done. So do you think? that science and medicine are concerned with oxidative stress. So 
here are some of the reasons why it's important, okay? Last year, when I looked and was doing this, I was looking at, I typed in cancer and oxidative stress, and I saw about 17,000 and a half studies had been already done on that. Within the year, 19,742. In one year, nearly 2,200 more studies being done on cancer and its relationship to oxidative stress. I typed in diabetes. Last year, we had nearly 14,000 studies done. This year, it's over 15,000. We've increased that study by nearly 1,700. Very important, right? So then we look at heart disease. Last year, almost 10,000. This year, almost 11,000. We've increased that one, 1,100. Lung disease. Last year, 5,800. This year, 65. As you can see by when we were looking at this, uh, arthritis, 115, now 1294, up. But the one that really got me, now this one really got me, was Alzheimer. There was only 3,000, like 3,600 studies done as of last year, but this year, 63, over 6,300 studies done on Alzheimer. That many more studies nearly 2,800 studies done on oxidative stress. So how does it happen? How do we get oxidative stress? How do we get that buildup of free radicals, right? It's breathing, okay? It's like putting fuel in the car, which is a cool thing, right? We wanna get somewhere. And then the next thing we know, we've got the exhaust, which in our, it's similar to our free radical oxidative stress. It's eating, even if it's good, even if it's organic, right? It still has to have the act of metabolizing. It's stress. None of us here know that word, right? Mental or emotional stress. It's pesticides, insecticides, growth hormones, medications, pollution, electrical magnetic frequencies, this is a big one for me. I love the sun. I, I'm, I've never made a friend with sunscreen. I'd like to, but it doesn't happen. It's genetics. How were you born? What was your DNA like? Over-exercise. Can you believe that? I have a friend that runs the Marine Marathon, 50 miles. Her husband hates it because she's sick for two weeks afterwards. Yeah, you talk about an accumulation of free radicals when you run like that. Currently, a healthy body makes over 30 sextillion. That's a bunch of zeros, isn't it? And an average, average healthy body. Now, if you're doing bad things, not like any of us had a drink last night, right? No. Or smoking, um, not eating correctly, not eating often enough, it, that number will be greater. It's like the rusting of an engine, okay? Or it's like the steak that we forgot we bought and we left it too long in that refrigerator. Or God forbid you ever had, leave one in your trunk, that's worse. <laughs> now, so what we were doing holistically up until now was direct antioxidants. You guys know those, right? The vitamin E, the vitamin C, the ashi berries. That seemed to be okay. It was all we had, and it was working in the blood directly one-to-one. -one. But that's a war you can't fight when you're making 36 trillion. And you think, how can we make 36 trillion free radicals per day? How many cells are in your body? The jury's... <laughs> There was like, you're right. Uh, the last study I saw, and they're not sure, like 37 and a half trillion cells working every day, producing oxidative stress, right? When you're doing battle in the blood one to one, and then I don't know if any of you read Dr. Talbert's book, uh, Deadly Antioxidants. They're now realizing that the direct antioxidants can work against us. 
So, now what? Ta-da! Here's what we could do with the direct antioxidants. We could, you guys want to join me on this one tonight? We could have 87 glasses of wine. They won't know who we are, nor will we. We could eat 350 oranges. We could do 30 pounds of berries. Now, I could probably do this one, 15 pounds of chocolate. We could do 120 vitamin C tablets. We could do a half a pound of sprouts. You ever seen a half a pound? You know how light those things are, right? It just doesn't make sense, does it? So we got to figure a better way. So what is the better way? And it's NERF2 activation. This is exciting. How would you like to turn on the survival enzymes and work in the DNA at a ratio of one to one million every single second? Do you think we might do battle better? So. With that, I'm not a doctor, I don't play one on TV, but I brought one. How's that? Is that cool? My dear friend, Dr. Jean DeLucia. Yay, Doc. Thank you, Dee, for having me. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for having me here. Dee uh, showed you a little bit about uh, but what, what I'm about. I'm going to tell you a little bit in a different perspective because I was trained in very Western medicine, so um, I don't understand a lot of anything else that, uh, that we weren't trained until I ran across things like this. Um, I, my name is Dr. Gene DeLucia. I'm a DO, proud to say. Uh, I think we are trained a little bit more whole body than the MDs, and yet we're still trained in Western medicine. So uh, I actually was born here in Missouri. I was born in Kirksville, Missouri. Uh, because my dad was in school here. Uh, grew up in Ohio and came back to Kirksville until I went, I attended osteopathic school there. Uh, A.T. Still, Still School of Osteopathic Medicine is there. It used to be called Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, and then right after I got out of there, I moved to Florida because it was too cold here. So, <laughs> and that's how I know D. Um, but I, um, I, you know, when we're trained in Western medicine, we, um, we're taught to diagnose disease, and we're taught to treat in one of two ways. We're taught to give you drugs for those diseases, and, uh, or we can cut it out if, it's, uh, if you're a surgeon and it's resectable. But that's about it. We're really not taught um, prevention. We're not taught nutrition, which is the basis of our health. Uh, I think we got less than a week of nutrition, and uh, most of it was that food pyramid, which turned out to be all wrong. So, uh, but that was it back 40 years ago. I, st I still don't believe they teach nutrition in school. I talked to a, a student, a medical school student, he said they got about a week's worth of nutrition. So it's sad to say that, uh, you know, this is not a, we're not taught prevention. This is not a, a health care industry in this country. It's a disease care industry. You're healthy, we don't get paid. You gotta come in for your diseases. So uh, when I started practicing medicine, you know, I was young and healthy. My patients were young and healthy. I, I had a family practice. I also did a lot of sports medicine. I was one of the uh, high school uh, sports doctors for over 20 years. Uh, and I also did some professional uh, sports medicine. But I, I, it was fun because those kids would get hurt. Uh, our body's ability at that age to heal itself is great. They'd mend themselves, they'd be back, okay? My patients were young and pretty healthy, and I was. And so we'd see them for things that worse, they had got some infection. I'd give you an antibiotic and, and, and get rid of the infection. As it turns out, we way overuse those too. So, but uh, as I got older and my patient population got older, uh, I started seeing more diseases. And I can tell you it was very frustrating because we're passing out more and more drugs to them. And I myself, as I aged, started getting diseases and having to take medications. And, and we don't cure any chronic disease in Western medicine. You know, we treat endpoints. We don't look at causes. We don't really, you know, we put band-aids on things. It was very frustrating for me. I, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the idea of aging. I didn't like the way I felt. I didn't like having to take medications. And I was taking multiple things, blood pressure, because I'm sure stress of being a doctor, I don't know what it was. Um, uh, things for arthritis, aches and pains, uh, reflux. And I'm thinking, this, this doesn't cut it. 
So years ago, I joined the A4M, American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. I don't know if any of you know what that is, but they're forward-thinking doctors. Uh, I like to think they're 21st century doctors looking for other ways other than passing out pills for symptoms to, to maybe slow down that aging process or, or hopefully someday reverse it even. And that's really where I started years ago to look for things to, to help my patients be healthier. And one of those early things were uh, we're replacing our hormones with bioidentical hormones, not chemical versions. And, and, and I thought that makes sense to me. I was healthier when I was 20 than where I was at 50 or 60. So if I could raise the, my hormone levels back to that youthful level, it made a lot of sense. So maybe that would help, and it did help some. We did give a lot of bioidentical hormone replacements, raise those levels to youthful level. Uh, we can keep you younger a little longer, because after all, we're only here for one thing on Earth. We're here to reproduce our species. Once we go past that age, Mother Nature wants us out of here. So she hustles us along by dropping our hormone levels, and we age quicker. Uh, that's one reason, okay? Oxidative stress is the other, cellular damage. So about seven years ago, I was shown a study, and it showed me a way to reduce our oxidative stress level significantly reduce the damage of the cells. And it was done with an herbal combination. Now, we didn't know anything about herbs in, in, in medical school. We're not taught that. Herbs are something we smoked in college. I never inhaled, so. Uh, and who knew that turned out to be medicinal also, huh? <laughs> so, but, um, but that was it. So when I saw this, I had to start to look for myself because you know, I didn't know herbs could do anything for us. So I was shown a study that was done at the University of Colorado, and it was an herbal synergistic blend of five herbs. And, uh, and it showed that that synergistic blend could lower oxidative stress by an average of 40% in 30 days. And everyone tested, and they tested people in their 20s all the way up to 80 years old. And within 30 days, they could not tell the, the age-related difference between that 20-year-old and 80-year-old. And I thought, I want that. If that works that well, uh, I want that. So I started looking at the research behind this and how it worked. And like Dee said a little bit before, uh, it's not taking a direct antioxidants. We've all done that. And, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry in this country. Your vitamin C, your vitamin E, those type of things sold in every GNC, every drugstore uh, across the nation, multi-billion dollars. It's just not very effective. So when this worked differently with NRF2 activation, uh, I, I was very, very surprised. So it took, took some education for me to look at it and see what it was. So oxidative stress and disease, this is a new approach to health and longevity. Not just better health, but longer life. And that's really what we aim for. So what is oxidative stress? Dee mentioned this before. Oxidative stress is a disturbance of the balance between the production of your reactive oxygen species, your free radicals that are damaging our cells, and the antioxidant defenses. Those are our antioxidant enzymes. When we're young, we make plenty of those. And we can balance that out. So every bit of antioxidant, um, antioxidant enzymes that we have will neutralize those free radicals. But as we age, we start to get unbalanced, and we don't have the same amount of antioxidant enzymes that protect our cells. And we start to get cellular damage, and that's aging at the cellular level, and diseases. So causes of oxidative stress, D went into this, um, living itself, you're making, <laughs> you're making energy in your cells, you're creating damage, okay? And like D says, this is just like your car motor. You put fuel in, you put oxygen in, you get energy to run that car, but you also get waste products. Now in your car, you've got a catalytic converter. That catalytic converter converts those to a safer form and it goes out your exhaust. And your cell, and every cell in your body, uh, produces energy, ATP. It takes food in, fuel, it takes oxygen in, and it produces energy for our, for our cells and our bodies to run. It produces waste products. Those are free radicals. So those free radicals are very highly reactive, and those free radicals damage our cells. They're bouncing around in our cells, trying to pair up with something else, and it's damaging the, the DNA of our cells. It's damaging the mitochondria of our cells. And when we're young, we have enough antioxidant enzymes to neutralize that, and they're dumped out of our body as, as waste. 
through our various organs, sweat, breathing, urine, stool. They, they come out that way. So, but as we age, we start to have more and more problems, less ability to protect ourselves. So uh, other things will increase your rate of aging, your rate of damage to your cells. Emotional stress increases your oxidative stress. Trauma and injury, infections, inflammation, excessive exercise, Dee talked about this. You're making a lot of free radicals because you're making a lot of energy. If you overdo it, you're, you're damaging your body. Under exercise, so there is a balance there. And if you do it right, you'll be very healthy. Smoking, probably one of our biggest oxidative stressors that we can do. Alcohol in excess. So that's another one. Um, pesticides, some of our xenobiotics, some of the things in our food, our air, and our, and our water that we get in our bodies. Inflammation, poor diet, this is huge in this country. The standard American diet is terrible. You eat a highly inflammatory diet with simple carbs and sugars, uh, way too many animal proteins, not enough good phytonutrients, those different colorful fruits and vegetables. That really has a highly protective um, uh, ability, and very, very few of us eat enough of those things. Uh, pollutions, uh, certain drugs, many drugs, uh, statins, anybody that takes a statin, it's highly, highly damaging to our cells. Um, our chemotherapies, another one, very, very damaged, causing high oxidative stress, radiation from the sun, from, from treatments, Cause, causes more free radicals, oxidative stress results in cellular aging, eventually disease and death, death of the cell and death of the organism. Here are some of the many diseases we see there. Now we've discovered over 200 diseases directly related to oxidative stress. Dee showed you some of those studies. And there are now thousands of studies. So any place from heart disease, uh, MIs, um, skin diseases, dermatitis, melanoma, skin aging itself, kidney diseases, joints, all these inflammatory arthritis, all a result of free radical damage, increased oxidative stress, lung diseases, asthma, COPD, cancers, brain diseases. This is important, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ADHD, autism. These are all directly related to oxidative stress. High damage, high oxidative stress, low antioxidant enzymes. That's what happens in those. Um, our immune system, any autoimmune disorder, uh, irritable bowel, MS, cancer, our blood vessels, endothelial, dysfunction, uh, multi-organ diseases, diabetes, aging dis itself is a multi-organ disease. So those things, eye diseases, these are all directly related to the amount of cellular damage and oxidative stress that we have. So as Dee mentioned, direct antioxidants cannot neutralize free radicals as efficiently as indirect antioxidants. That one-to-one -one ratio, that vitamin C I take in, that thousand milligrams breaks into milli to molecules, each molecule binds with one free radical, and within a couple hours it's eliminated as waste from my body. It's just not very effective. And remember, that's a multi-billion dollar a year industry in this country. When I activate my own body's ability to make our own antioxidant enzymes, it's millions of times as powerful, and it's 24 hours a day. It's a huge, huge difference. It's a huge medical breakthrough. Here is a study, this is published in PubMed, talking about direct versus indirect antioxidant properties, inducers of cytoprotective proteins. And, I, and anybody who wants to see this, we can give you copies of this. We won't go through all these. Um, what is NRF2? It stands for a nuclear factor. It is a messenger protein in our cell that is ordinarily bound to other proteins, not very bioavailable, but as we take an NRF2 activator, it, it releases that bound, bound protein and it is allowed to, to activate our DNA and our genes to do essentially what they did when we were kids. And I like that. So it's the master regulator of our antioxidant response. I like that. There are several ways to do this. There are multiple, multiple ways to activate our, our NRF2. These are some of these. We can use things like uh, ashwagandha, um, turmeric, very good NRF2 activator. Uh, another one is sulforaphane. It's a broccoli sprouts derivative. It's probably the, the gold standard in, of NRF2 activation. 
Uh, there are chemical versions now on the market, and I'll show you a couple of those too, because the drug companies have caught on to this, and they understand how powerful this is, and they want their piece of the pie. And they, you're going to see more and more of these chemical versions coming out in the future. So this is one. This was a, this was a synergistic combination. This is a master regulator, but when you combine these in a certain way, these are all weak activators of NRF2, but when you start to combine them, you can see the synergistic effect we can get. So certain combinations will activate NRF2 much, much more than just taking single herbs. This one increases your SOD, superoxide dismutase. This is one of our main antioxidant enzymes by 34%. Uh, catalase increases by 54%. They discovered later that glutathione increases by up to 300% in our cells. That's hard to do. I can't take glutathione by pill and have it being very effective because your stomach acid destroys it. You can take it by IV and it works very well, but it's not very practical. You can't run around with that IV in your, your arm all the time. Here's a study comparing different um, uh, amounts of activation. So sulforaphane, uh, has always been the gold standard of natural antioxidant uh, enzyme production, okay? Dimethyl fumarate is the first drug version of this on the market. This is an MS drug, okay? This was made by Biogen Pharmaceuticals. It's been out for almost two years now. Last year it sold almost $4 billion worth of this drug. And it's the best thing they've ever come up with for MS. Uh, drug versions, chemical versions. But because it's a chemical, you also get chemical side effects. It suppresses your bone marrow, so it re decreases your immunity. It damages your liver. It causes nausea, vomiting. It's about, uh, it's about $5,000 a month. That's the cost of this drug. And yet it's the number one MS drug now in the world. Very impressive results, not very impressive side effects. The other drug, methyl was one of Abbott Labs' drugs. Uh, this was for chronic kidney failure and diabetes. And it works. The problem, when they brought it through the testing process, the human testing process, they, uh, I think they killed a few people with it. So they took it off the market. They never got it passed through. But they're trying. You're going to see more and more of these in the future. The product 5X is that synergistic blend. And you can see, for a fraction of that cost of that drug, uh, how much more powerful it is. So this was a study that I saw seven years ago. Induction of human superoxide dismutase and catalase in vivo. Fundamentally new approach to antioxidant therapy. This was done at the University of Colorado where this product was developed. These are some of the NRF2 publications. We started looking at this in the 1990s, but you can start to see the interest as people understood what this was. So in 2014, there were over 5,000 studies now, today, there are almost 9,000 studies on NRF2 activation. It has become mainstream medicine. You're going to see the drug companies and the doctors eventually get it and use this. Uh, this is a study that might interest some of you. Or overexpression of NRF2 protects cerebral cortical neurons from ethanol-induced apoptotic death. So if you understand this, <laughs> These studies illustrate the importance of NRF2-dependent maintenance of glutathione homeostasis in cerebral cortical neurons and the defense against oxidative stress and apoptotic death elicited by ETOH exposure. So if you're going to go out and drink tonight, take your NRF2 activator before you go. Protect your brain cells. That's what this study is showing you. This is a study I found interesting. NRF2, a guardian of health span and a gatekeeper of species longevity. Mounting evidence across an evolutionarily distant species. That means every mammal they've tested. We have, we have the same energy production in our cell, the same waste product production. So this works in every mammal. Are the NRF2 ARE dependent components associated with both longevity and, ex and extension of health span? I want that. I want to live longer but healthier. And that's what the studies show. Uh, absolutely. And people do all the time. Um, this is a study done at Washington State University. This was published in 2015. And what they did is they took all the studies on NRF2 in the different disease states and ways to activate NRF2. And they published this study. So this was a summary at the time of 2015. There's been much more done since then. So they said NRF2 is a master regulator of detoxification, also antioxidant 
anti-inflammatory and other cytoprotective mechanisms raised by health-promoting factors. This was included, they talked about different diets, including the Mediterranean diet and the Okinawan diet. They, they concluded those were important parts uh, of longevity, of health. But this was their conclusion. We may be on the verge of a new literature on health effects of NRF2, which may well become the most extraordinary therapeutic and most extraordinary preventative breakthrough in the history of medicine. That's a bold statement, and I agree with it because I have used NRF2 activation for seven years and in thousands of people, and it literally changed the way we practice medicine. It was fun, fun to see. We actually saw people get healthier. I took more people off their medications than I put on, including myself. So it really, it really became a passion of mine to, to start to educate maybe the Western doctors too on what we have. Um, gene activation via NRF2, they've discovered now, when they originally looked at this, they thought that this only activated two genes. They discovered now it activates over 500 genes. We upregulate the genes that protect us. We downregulate the, the, the genes that potentially damage us. So these are very, very interesting. NRF2 dependent antioxidant and cytoprotective effects, as you can see, they start to increase our, our production of our antioxidant enzymes, catalase superoxide, dismutase, glutathione, uh, and those are type of things that we'll start to do with this. And we start to continue to see more and more studies on this. NRF2 dependent cytoprotection is demonstrated in studies on uh, reduced susceptibilities to many cancers, neurodegeneration, lung disease, impaired liver and GI function and inflammation. These are studies already done and published. Detoxification genes activated by NRF2. So there are 25 different genes that are encoded an enzyme that detoxifies xenobiotics, the pesticides we get in our bodies, the, the, the pollutants. Uh, 12 genes involved with detoxification of carbon containing, containing xenobiotics. Five genes that increase glutathione production. Uh, MT1 and MT2 genes coding for metallothionine involved with detoxification of heavy metals. NRF2 increasing glutathione also aids in heavy metal detoxification. NRF2 and detoxification, is the primary responder to toxin. NRF2 upregulates expression of compounds and enzymes that promote efficient neutralization, conjugation, and elimination of toxins. Very important in today's modern society. Glutathione is dramatically increased with NRF2 activation it's the single most important detoxification enzyme. It acts as an antioxidant. It regulates our nitric oxide cycle. It's involved in DNA repair, protein synthesis, enzyme activation. Uh, every organ system is affected by glutathione. Very important, and we can upregulate this by up to 300%. Anti-inflammatory effects. Reduces the inflammatory response through many pathways. pathways. It suppresses multiple pro-inflammatory genes. Uh, it stimulates anti-inflammatory genes. Uh, it upregulates hemoxygenase, oxygenase, which modulates innate immunity, inflammation, and wound healing. Mitochondrial biogenesis, autophagy. NR NRF2 stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, it helps to monitor the energy of our cells. We've also discovered now that it starts to help to repair that damaged mitochondria. So very, very important in neurodegenerative diseases. Antifibrotic effects. Uh, there are studies in the lung, liver, and kidney. Uh, stimulated differentiation of fibroblast. Much of the effect is due to anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory effects of NRF2. Uh, very important, longevity. Long-lived species possess proteins resistant to unfolding, indicative of enhanced protein stability. NRF2 preserves proteasome function which prevents unfolding and removes damaged proteins. Long-lived species have elevated NRF2 levels. So the more we can elevate our NRF2, uh, the longer we can live. Neurodegeneration. So NRF2 is required for healing after traumatic brain injury. Uh, decreases neuronal cell death associated with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. And I've seen this clinically. It's very, very impressive results. Uh, the astrocytes protects neighboring cells from reactive oxygen species, cytotoxic threats. Uh, the age-related decline in NRF2 is thought to be responsible for age-related cognitive decline in mice. 
and RF2 in the brain. We see studies that improve things like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, ALS, traumatic brain injury, MS, and nerve cell protection. Other studies, a multi-organ protector, and I'm not going to go through each of these. The clinical potential of influencing NRF2 signaling in degenerative and immunological disorders. Clinical potential of influencing NRF2 signal, signaling in degenerative and immunological disorders has been shown to play an important role in mouse models of neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. Uh, also reported to be relevant to acute neurological disorders such as stroke. Oxidative stress plays an important role in these neurodegenerative disorders, including the degeneration of dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's disease. So very impressive. Up till now, we treat these diseases by symptoms, by Band-Aids. Now we can actually reverse some of these. Emerging roles in NRF2 and phase two antioxidant enzymes in neuroprotection. Another one, a valuable therapeutic target for treatment of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, Regulation in brain health and disease, implications of cerebral inflammation. Here's another one on Parkinson's disease. Here's one on mitochondrial dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. And RF2 neuroprotection in Alzheimer's disease. And RF2 is dramatically reduced in the hippocampus. And RF2 ARE pathways is impaired in Alzheimer's, boosting NRF2 activation. Uh, by overexpressing NRF2 conserved protection, uh, reduces cell death of neurons in the hippocampus. NRF2 ARE pathway may also protect against vascular dementia. This is an interesting study. This was paid by Biogen Pharmaceuticals. This was the company that came out with the chemical version. This was done by their chief scientist, this guy. And he published this paper. This paper said our finding indicate that several NRF2 activators are able to significantly increase antioxidant enzyme production in oligodendrocytes. Interesting, our herbal product blend, a dietary supplement consisting of herbal ingredients was the most potent inducer and therefore most suited therapeutically. Very interesting. That was their study paid for by them. So, NRF2, a guardian of health span and gatekeeper of species longevity. These are some of the diseases already studied. Okay, and you can start to see the diseases of the heart, cardiovascular system, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, kidney diseases, metabolic diseases, even obesity, toxic liver diseases, chronic lung diseases, sepsis, autoimmune diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases, HIV, MS, epilepsy. Huge, huge breakthrough, huge breakthrough. So NRF2 is a revolution in science. It is the most important anti-aging pathway in the human body. I'm going to give this back to Dee. Back in, I think it was 1987, he pub published the Clorox bleach test, okay? And what the test was, he had a different purpose in it, but it was the discovery of oxidative stress. And in that test, he said, when you have them sniff Clorox bleach, you have a strong muscle, right? Almost everybody's going to go weak to identify that. And then he listed several substances that may work to negate it. And then each substance he correlated to a certain aspect of the body, a certain problem somewhere, right? So he said in the study, but not one will work with everybody. So I found that incredibly exciting. And so what I wanted to know was would this work with everybody? Would a herbal compound work with everybody? So that's what we're going to demonstrate here. Now he also, he also suggested that um, we could rub the neural lymphatics, excuse me, those guys don't say neural lymphatics, do they? The Chapman reflexes. I was corrected severely by his uh, friend, Dr. McCord, Kelly McCord. D, we don't call those neural lymphatics. Okay, no problem. Huh? But we, do. but we do, right? And I went, well, 
a rose by any other name, still a rose, right? So now, Miss Jan is the only person I know that doesn't age. Actually, I really wanted to get a picture of a baby and superimpose her face, because I'm sure she looked that way forever. May I, Jan? Yeah, okay. arms, right? Right, darling. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a strong muscle. Good. And then I'm going to have her sniff the bleach. Put a little behind your ear. No, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. Oops, sorry, darling. OK. Yeah. Yeah, right? Blow out. OK, good. Because this worked yesterday. OK, now I'm going to have you sniffing the bleach. But we're going to have you hold the compound. Can you do both? Sure. So we're having her hold an herbal NRF2. And I cannot get the arm down. Now, so far, and I want you to please come by the booth and let me try it with you as well. Because I've yet to see it fail. And we all know that somebody, it will fail. But not yet. Now, I'm going to show you something else. May I? Yeah. OK, cool. Lovely, huh? Now, it freaked me out when this happened. But guess what I found out? The people that held strong when they sniffed the bleach without holding the compound were already taking an NRF2 activator. Right? I thought the test was wrong. So I was like, holy crap, what's going on, right? Here we find it. So you now have the information. You may want to be like me and do your own studies. You may want to come by and look at some of the studies, the, the full peer-reviewed studies. And some of them are 32 pages, like uh, the American Heart Association, like Virginia Commonwealth, like Ohio State, like LSU, like Harvard. They're fascinating if you're into that kind of thing. But nonetheless, as Dr. Thies said, you know, hopefully our goal here is to be the candle to light the way for others. And I pray to God that we did that today. So thank you for your patience, your time, and your love. I look forward to seeing you all, OK? Thank you.